of color and got it. Excuse me. And I, I just love all that stuff. So I, over the years, I developed this method of working. It's called closed coil basketry. I discovered when I taught a class for the NBO. And um, this, is, this is what they look like. It's basically a sewing technique. And there, it's the threads. And I just keep sewing around and around. So what you have is a 3D Fibonacci spiral. That's really tightly sewn. So that's where I am and how I got here. And I, I love it. And the pieces behind me, you'll notice in the video, I always need to have two things going because my hands don't, don't work all day on baskets anymore. It's just happened. And so I spent three and a half hours at night on them. And then during the day, I've been developing these wall pieces. And you saw one in the video of the light basket with the wall piece behind it. And that's something I'm doing now. That's my day job. And then I've got my night job. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lynn francis Lynn, let's uh, hear from you. Good evening. Um, I've been working with fiber since I was very young. I began knitting at four. I was weaving in high school. I went to college and majored in textile design. And then light took me on a different journey and spent 33 years in museum retail. And I retired recently. Um, but even before I retired, about a decade before I retired, I, I, textiles were calling me again. And I went to basketry and started taking classes. And I have taken classes with two people that are here with us tonight, Lois Russell and Natalie Maybach. Thank you both very much. Um, and baskets really spoke to me. Um, I left the, the loom behind and I liked really uh, the portability of them, the sculptural effect to them, the fact that they were 3D. And now I make um, sculptural weaving is really what art baskets that are concept driven and quite often things that are very personal to me. Thank you so much. Uh, Lois, let's hear from you. Thank you, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, I have been making baskets since the late 1980s, but I grew up in a family of people who make things. Um, I like to say that none of the women in my family ever sat down with idle hands. You were either knitting, crocheting, hooking a rug, quilting, doing something. Um, there was boat building, there was all sorts of stuff going on. So it's hard for me to imagine a life that doesn't involve making. I did spend a lot of my life as a professional journalist. And uh, my mother said to me in the late 1980s when she was a weaver, she said, do you want to try basket making? I, I, I think you would like it. And I immediately became addicted is really the best word. Um, baskets took over my life. I collect them, I make them. Um, uh, it's just, I find them fascinating. Uh, there are endless things that you can put into a basket, you can make a basket out of, uh, endless techniques. I am never bored. And um, there's always something to learn, whether I'm learning it from Lisa Hunter at Haystack way back when, um, or from any of the other people here informally where I'm just sort of saying, would you show me how you did that? And there you go, you, you've learned something else. I live in Somerville, Massachusetts, and I am branching out post pandemic, teaching myself tapestry weaving in, and improvisational quilting. And I'm really quite um, taken with both of them. So, and I see them as very related to my basket work. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Elizabeth, let's hear from you. So um, I began in Boston in uh, what we used to call, uh, let's see, you might remember this, the fiber revolution, when a lot of the um, weaving uh, factories closed and um, the art students and um, other people in Boston used to go out there to get all kinds of yarns. It was a pretty exciting time to be in the Boston area, the early, the mid seventies. Uh, my early work um, was inspired by a trip to Nepal and India. And at that time using basketry, I was using coiling with paper and raffia. And coming back from that trip, I was very much inspired by the shapes of the Na Naples windows. So I did some pieces there. Later on, I got involved in using pine needles so I could make larger sculptures and still used raffia and often dyed the raffia. Um, in 1996, I was lucky enough to get an entrance um, into Lasco, the real Lasco cave. Being an artist, they let uh, five people in a day. And this really started uh, my work in a different direction, still in basketry, but because of the experience of seeing the painted cave walls with the romping bulls and horses, I came back and wanted to add paint to the surface of my uh, fiber sculpture. And this made me, um, gave me a whole different direction the fluidity of design that I could work on the surface and the painting of imagery. So that's really what I've been doing now. And as you can see, uh, Nepal, uh, France, and in the last um, 15 years, I've traveled a great deal. And each of those trips seem to inspire me and uh, give me an opportunity to, um, uh, to, to make a new series of works the ones you see at the museum are inspired by Egypt and um, Morocco and Peru. And um, that's been an exciting time to produce the work that you'll see at the museum. Thank you so much. Uh, Jean Flanagan, let's hear from you next. Hi, well, I, I actually come from a fiber arts background, but my mother owned a marine canvas shop so I grew up, I learned how to sew on a commercial industrial sewing machine. That was what we used <laughs> in our house for making our clothes. Um, and so, so I actually grew up with the whole industrial fabrics world, the whole industrial textiles, um, which had highly influences what now I do in basketry and what materials I use and how I think about materials in basketry. But I, you know, I did, knitting and learned knitting and learned quilting and my entire, all the women in my family quilt, including in-laws because they came from my mom's shop when, before they got married to my brother. And I, um, so yeah, you know, so quilting and, you know, moving on with life and sort of, it didn't thrill me. I didn't like do quilts the way my mom and my sisters do quilts. And I actually, my nephew, went to mass art and lived with me He, I live in Somerville, mass. So he got his MFA there and he was like, you have to take a course at mass art. So I, my first course there, I was a biology major as an undergrad. I took drawing and I was like, can you flunk drawing? I'd never like taken a art class in my life. And, but the second semester I discovered there was a basket making class by taught by Natalie Niebach. And so I got this amazing 12 week semester, full semester class of everything from random weave all the way through um, to hex weave. And it just, she introduced you to a little bit of everything and encouraged going out and exploring materials to build with and so my biggest sculpture that I've made to date is an elephant, which has marked in the, marched in the Honkfest parade several <laughs> years. So my elephant is four and a half feet high and six feet long, and it's made out of treadmill tread. So in the basement of Harvard 
the Harvard, one of the gymnasiums at Harvard, we found 12 rolled up treadmill because on commercial treadmills, you just, you replace the tread every, you know, if they're going to be used 12 hours a day, you have to keep replacing the treadmill. And we're like, there's no janitor that's going to carry this entire box of treadmill out of the wet basement in the bottom of the gymnasium and off to the trash somewhere. So I gathered them all up and they sat in my studio for about a year. And I was like, cut them into two inch strips. They're 11 feet long when you open them up and started weaving because I was like, I want to do something with this. And so I've been working with industrial materials basically for most of my work, um, unless, I've, unless I went to paper, but I really love the whole reuse part of industrial materials. And I like the fact that they're textured and they hold on to whatever you're trying to do. Um, so what you, the baskets that are in the show I have are, I was, I was actually taking a shoemaking class and went to the leather shop and he had a whole bag full of boot laces. So the two brown baskets are actually, if you look inside them, you can see the ends of all the boot laces. So that determined the size of the basket was my boot laces were this long and that's what I had big enough to make the basket with. Um, and so I loved using the copper wire, which was another class um, to learn how to do knotted nets, like fishing nets, but out of copper. And so just, you know, I, you start to put all of those things together. Um, the black basket is definitely often yet another direction. Um, I finished it the night before I gave it to Annie for this show. Um, and Lois was, was um, Lois Russell was very much part of my sort of exploring. I was trying to make a large base and the base went so wonky and it wouldn't stay flat. And it would just, I, I took it out halfway a couple of times and I couldn't get it to go big and flat because the material I'm working with is so slippery that, um, so yeah, you know, just when you're using sort of industrial materials, these are actually pull cord. The black is um, sash cord from Venetian mm -hmm. blinds for, for Venetian blinds that I get out of, a, out of a company and I get it on thousand yard rolls. So I have lots of it. You'll see lots more of my work in that. Um, and and it just so I started to build the little arms and oh yeah, well let's put some. And, and so I had these arms and then I started making and we like the whole shiny strings and then I didn't like, so it, the basket actually built in stages like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to commit to this, but I have no idea what I'm doing after that. And then I'm going to commit to that. And I'm no idea what I'm doing after that. So I really, then I couldn't figure out how to use all the strings. And so that basket was actually a real move in a whole nother direction. I really like it. And I really had fun making it. So I think. <laughs> definitely I will do more stuff in that direction. So, so that was, um, that was fun, but that I'm definitely material driven once in a while I do concept baskets, but mostly it's just playing around with how do industrial fabrics fibers work in basket making. So. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, let's hear from you next. I feel as if we were all separated at birth or something, because I could take a little, you know, like three sentences for <laughs> each of you and put them together and it's my story. So um, I uh, um, was that kid who always wanted to color and always wanted to make things. And my family very much like Lois's made things all the time, not necessarily textiles, but other things. Um, and when I got to college, decided I would be a, um, an art major and I took fine arts. I took painting and I was terrible at it. And I didn't really know why. And then I realized it's because I wanted to make things, not pictures of things. And so through a whole set of circumstances, I won't go through here, um, I ended up getting an MFA in textile design. And that sort of set me up for everything. And I realized then how the work of the hand and how the hand and materials interact was infinitely interesting. Uh, so that for a long time I did baskets um, like Elizabeth, I, we're probably the only two people in the world who have continued doing 
coiling with paper on the surface, but we <laughs> hang in there. Um, and, uh, and did collages for a long time. Then kind of after about 35 years of making coiled baskets, I thought, where can I go with this and started putting them on shelves and in boxes. And then I started painting the shelves and boxes. And then I started doing more of the painting and less of the basketry. And then I wanted to do something other than basketry. So I started with uh, clay. As Arlene went from clay to basketry, I went from basketry to clay and did hand building, which is very much like basketry in a way. It has a soft hand the way that coiling does and uh, started working in a, a lot of drawing again then. So all of these things kind of have come together and they're all still pretty much on the same burner, um, which is a, a lovely way to work these days. Um, and it's true across the board, I think, with in the arts that um, anybody can do anything and put it together and if it works, it counts. And so uh, we're at a, a really terrific time uh, to be doing what we do. One of the things I love about basketry is that it pays it pays you for doing a good job. If you don't do a good job, it's going to fall over or it's going to have a hole in it or it's not going to be the, the shape you want. Whatever it is, it, you get rewarded for doing a good job. And that's not true with all materials and all techniques, I think. So, um, so uh, I think we all have been doing a pretty good job at what we're doing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Natalie, let's hear from you next. Okay. Um, thank you for everyone for coming. And I'm like, Lissa, I feel like a lot of what you've already said, I could also now say, um, I definitely came into basketry later. And it was really, I became a sculptor because of my interest in science. And basketry was really my first method of uh, my sculptural medium that, that I was using to explore questions I had about science. One of the things I love about basket weaving is that Basket weaving is very, very tactile. And I always tell my students, learning how to weave is teaching your hands how to listen. So your eyes are useful, but it's really your hands that have to learn how to listen to the form. And there was something about that that I really needed to have in order to understand these very abstract questions I had about science. So I started, it was very uh, serendipitously. In around 2000 or so, I took classes at Harvard in their night school division in astronomy, and it coincided with Lois's class, Lois Russell at Cambridge Adult Ed. And so I would find myself going into these lecture halls at Harvard with all my bucket and sprayer and listening to these incredible lectures of, of space and time. And I wanted to find a way to make this tactile, to make this somehow something I could understand, because I've always been the kid that has to take things apart in order to understand them. And my science education was never one that encouraged that. So here was Lois teaching me all these techniques and I thought, well, psh, why not use them? And so I started to translate uh, scientific data related to astronomy using the basket. And it was sort of a very, you know, very crude way of thinking about the basket. I'm thinking about the basket, a three-dimensional grid that I can use to translate data with. And so I was making a lot of the work I was making at the beginning was using data related to astronomy uh, to, trans to use the basket to translate into these 3D forms that revealed a sort of dimensionality numbers that you, know, you wouldn't necessarily see on a, on a spreadsheet. And then it sort of opened up this, this box of possibilities of, wow, I can use the basket and these incredible techniques to, to ask all sorts of questions about science. And so at first, the art that I made was very much in the service of science. It was very didactic. I was making art pieces that, that began with a very specific question, such as how big is the sun? And then I would make a piece that would answer that question. But over the years, I've become more and more interested in how humans respond to the scientific phenomena. And uh, but several years after um, starting with astronomy, I started to focus on weather because it was a way that I could I, it was a very easy way to, to gather data on my own. And I started to focus on weather exclusively and then first you know, making pieces that explain the weather and then making more and more pieces that were really more trying to look at how humans were responding to weather, especially in this age of climate change. And so the pieces started to change. Um, I started to bring in music. I started to translate the data into musical scores and then translating those into sculptures. And so that kind of opened up uh, the possibility of collaborating with musicians and composers. And all of this really, um, all of this made me under, uh, explore sculpture in a, in, in a new way. And 
I have to say what I never anticipated is how much, how much I love basket weaving and how endless the possibilities, how endless the possibilities seem to me uh, in using these weaves to explore not just form, but also concepts. Um, I will also just plug one little thing in. Um, Lois Russell was my teacher. And the way that Lois Russell taught me, um, it was, I think, very instrumental in, in thinking about or being open to this idea of bridging science and art. And Lois would teach you how to start something, but then she would let you problem solve your way to the end. So that just sort of opened up all sorts of possibilities because everybody's ending is gonna be very different. So since the pandemic, um, I've been dealing, I've been focusing more and more on COVID data. So not just weather data, but now also looking at COVID data and the work is, is getting flatter, it's getting more personal. And so the piece that you see in the show is one of the very, it is the very first piece that I've shown since the pandemic. Um, it is a very new body of work and it's trying to understand this onslaught of COVID data that we're surrounded with every day and using these weaves to to weave some sort of understanding and some sort of solid ground in this pandemic that has really just shifted everyone's foundation. So that's what I do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sui, let's hear from you next. <laughs> yes, uh, hi, uh, I'm Sui uh, and I uh, work in New York and I, I was born and raised in uh, Seoul, Korea. Um, yeah, I learned uh, the basketry way uh, when I was attending um, uh, art school in uh, the college in Korea. Uh, and uh, I studied like a fiber art. So I learned like the weaving and embroidery and like a hand dye and like a textile design kind of like all the fiber art materials. But um, I was really like fascinating to create something by my hands. Like a like soft sculpture, so uh, the I enjoyed it. But um, like the I after graduation, like the, I did so many different jobs, like uh, such as creator and like the interior designers. <laughs> and uh, when I decided to study further in U.S. um, and I started like studying uh, the environmental design and interior architecture. And while I was attending college in the US, uh, I was wondering like if I, uh, the using basketry, like how I can create something like you know, something in architecture way. So I started like exploring, like making uh, the basketry forms in architecture way. So at the time, like the, I, uh, the use, on, I used the monofilament uh, to create uh, some organic forms. Then um, the bottom, like as you know, like you know, the creating some forms, like it takes time <laughs> uh, with like monofilament. So I was looking for some alternative materials, and I found like uh, the cable ties, and I just thought that uh, if the cable ties has like a different length. So it could be uh, the kind of like architecture modules. So I started like creating some like the organic forms with like the, uh, in uh, the, with cable ties in architecture way. Uh, it was really like a great material cause like easy to get and very artificial and easy to manipulate. And they have like the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, the bulk, uh, you know, like the, yeah, so uh, really like easy to take. Um, and like uh, the, uh, uh, the foam, like they can like the support like by themselves, like without structure, it was really fascinating. So now like I'm working with like those cable ties and like the monofilament to create like the, uh, the various basket, basketry forms, uh, mostly organic forms. You know? And uh, now like I'm doing uh, some like size specific work with those, <laughs> uh, the fiber art and the soft, soft sculpture basketry, uh, uh, the sculptures. And uh, I'm very like the, uh, the interested and uh, I was really, 
I really loved uh, that like the, my work can like define like the, the given space. Uh, so I just keep continuing like the uh, uh, research, uh, the, those uh, the, uh, the given spaces uh, that I will uh, install and like the, I always like it, uh, uh, think how like it harmonize and how to uh, incorporate like uh, with my work with the site. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. And so currently like uh, the, some of my uh, cable tire work uh, are showing uh, at the Cal Museum, uh, the outside and inside the atrium. Uh, so I hope you enjoy my work when you uh, have a chance to visit Cahun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Jeanette, let's hear from you next. Uh, yeah, um, first of all, I think I'm the true newcomer to this whole group. So I really want to thank you all for, yeah, I'm just grateful to be among um, people who have been doing this for a very, very long time, from what I hear. Um, I'm, I've really only been making baskets, like maybe a year and a half. Uh, I was working with fiber earlier. Um, but anyway, um, so maybe I just should start by um, sort of uh, answering the question I think that most people want to ask when they find out that I work with seaweed um, and that what they want to know is like how smelly is it <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, I just want to say well I, I try to skip the decomposing part and I, I take my work immediately from the salty uh, ice cold seawater and sort of finish it in that way. So I keep everything wet and salty and then I air dry it immediately. So when you skip the decomposing part of it, um, you get not the fishy or the sulfury smell, you just have the briny smell, which I personally really like because it says ocean to me. So anyway, I just wanted to start with that. But um, uh, to tell you a little about my background, I grew up on the Dutch coast um, and I grew up on a, a group of sort of loosely connected uh, islands. Uh, part of that part of the Netherlands is actually called Sealand. So uh, when I came to the US, I first came to New York, then to Boston. I worked as a book designer most of my life. Um, and uh, when I finally made it up to Maine, I just uh, totally fell in love with uh, the Blue Hill Peninsula and uh, with the, the beauty of the natural environment there. And uh, it made me feel at home. I mean, even though um, the coast of Maine is so very different from the Dutch coast, we have sandy beaches in the Netherlands, much like you have on the Cape. Um, just this, the smells and the, you know, the whole feeling of it felt very much like home. So, um, so my work is basically a response to this area. And I think, um, I think this sort of theme of belonging always sort of creeps into my work because I think as a, as an immigrant, uh, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's an ongoing theme, I think. Um, and when I make things, uh, I wanna to respond to the natural environment. I often um, make something and then go back and place it back into the environment and you sort of tweak it and you adjust it. And, and I, um, um, you know, you, you try to make it fit. And I think that's, that's, that's what it feels like, I think, when you, you come from a different culture and you try to make your life in a new place. Um, and um, so I'm, you know, I was surrounded by seaweed there and I just keep thinking, what can I do with this? I had been working as a fiber artist with wool and silk, uh, but I kind of wanted to keep it closer. Um, here's all this rock weed, what can I do with it? Um, and um, 
I kept keeping coming back to it. Um, I tried to, I, for, for a long time, I thought that I should really be able to preserve it in order to work with it. And so I did all this research and came across all these scary formulas with formaldehyde and all types of scary things. And I was just like, okay, I don't want to go there because I really want to sort of keep my work very sustainable. Um, and, um, and then one day I just saw some seaweed washed up on the beach and the wind had sort of twirled it into a, a circle kind of, and like a nest like shape and it had dried and it was hardened. And I realized that all of a sudden it, it had some solidity to it. It had, had some density to it. And I thinking I've just been making this way too complicated. I can just sow the seaweed wet and then dry it, done. <laughs> so um, anyway, so that's what I started to do. And um, yeah, the, the, as, I've, I've, as I've spent more time um, in Maine and in this beautiful environment, I've also just become very protective of, of the natural beauty there. I think um, coming from the Netherlands, which is a very densely populated country, uh, I, 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 it's such a luxury to have wild spaces and remote spaces to go to. And I think we should be very protective of them. And, um, and as I started working with the seaweed, uh, I learned so much about it. And um, I learned how it's basically an underwater forest that we should be protecting just as we are protecting the jungle in a way. Um, and it, uh, it sequesters carbon, it helps protect the seashore against uh, rising ocean um, levels. Um, anyway, there's so many ways in which, you know, we really should be thinking more about this resource and, and, and what it means to the environment, basically. So I, I don't, uh, all of these things sort of come together, I guess, in what I'm doing right now. And um, I've only started this a year and a half ago, so I still think I have a long way to go. Um, there's so much to explore. I, I recently found out that um, if you uh, put the dried seaweed in the sun, it will actually start to bleach and you can actually get naturally like reds and oranges and things like that. So that's something I want to look into. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure if I covered everything that I wrote down earlier, but uh, uh, that's sort of- Thank you so much. I'm uh, short of it, yeah. Uh, Arlene, let's hear from you now. Oh. Sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm really impressed to see how many people are interested in the basket uh, and the people that you have here and listening to us. So, so thank you all for coming in. Um, I was fascinated with baskets as a very, very young child. I grew up on a farm in Western Massachusetts in Hadley, and we use baskets for collecting all kinds of fruits and vegetables. And they weren't the same basket. They were always different depending upon uh, how you stacked the vegetables. Uh, for example, there was a huge wide bottom basket for asparagus. There was a very narrow basket for cucumbers. Uh, and then we repaired them in the winter after we worked with them all summer long. And, and I didn't realize um, how much I loved basketry until I started making them. Um, I was traveling uh, in the southern part of our country and I ran into a craft shop and there was a woman teaching Appalachian Mountain basketry. And I just stayed there for a whole week with her listening and learning the technique. So that kind of started my voyage with baskets and I have been traveling the country, taking classes. And then I started a business uh, selling baskets, traditional baskets, uh, the shaker baskets, the Nantucket baskets. And I was having trouble with my hands. 
um, I was using them too much and they were wearing out. So I decided to reinvent myself and I went back to school to a program at UMass Dartmouth uh, Fiber Art and Textile Design. And while I was there, I really changed the whole aspect of basketry and that I started conceptually designing baskets. I used the written word in most of the baskets. I was fascinated by articles I read. I was, was, was cutting up articles. I was writing from inspired masters. And then I started doing my own journals and was writing, stripping them and then putting them into baskets. Um, I use a framework with hardware cloth by wrapping each one, uh, each piece with uh, wax linen and then constructing them. And that's where the challenge came in because I always had something in my mind's eye, but when I went to make them, it always changed. Then I loved the forms that they were changing into. So I just went with it. They kind of, the forms and the material decided how the shape should be. And uh, I really loved incorporating uh, paper, which is, I primarily use Japanese paper, uh, Kiyoshi paper, uh, and because it feels so much like textiles. So that's where the forms and the material come from. And the written word there, I, I was at a show once and I was showing people the baskets and a young man came up to me. He probably was about 16 or 17 and said, how did you get that, that strip of paper off the computer with the written word? And I said, well, it didn't come off the computer. It's handwritten and I do the cross writing. So a lot of the uh, writing that I use is sometimes from poets and in order to avoid uh, public domain rights, uh, in order to avoid uh, rights from the author, I cross write it so you can't really read what is there. Um, it can't come across in that way. However, some of my journals I do leave and I do uh, leave them into the weaving structure so you can read them. I also work primarily with, uh, I do some printing and the printing has influenced my work, but most of my work is conceptually designed and I use material also inside some of the work such as a honeysuckle when I collect it. And then also I do printmaking and that is also uh, included in some of the work that I do. Thank you so much. So now we're gonna move into a question portion of the evening. And the first question I have for the group um, is, as contemporary basketry artists, where do you get your inspiration for your work? Is it in the materials, the techniques, concepts, or the storytelling? Mine okay. comes from my garden. Oh. I think so I see my work comes Oh, I, sorry, Pam. No, go ahead. <laughs> I think we all have our own. Go on. So what I was going to say is I spoke about that already, that primarily it's from uh, my ability to travel and experience other cultures and um, through sketching and photographing and meeting people um, in these different countries, coming back and interpreting that. Emily, yes. I'm interested in, in the natural world, not the built world. The world in my garden, the world in fields, the woods, and you'll see that. You can pretty much figure things out from titles, but it's all based on things I see and photographs I take. You know, I, I commented that I don't really use natural materials. I, I often take classes that require natural materials because you just learn how to manipulate materials differently. Um, but I fully appreciate the concept that when you actually use natural materials, it just takes a long time 
the gathering and the preparing and the getting ready to weave the basket. You know, rolling my my black cord off of the, off of the thousand yard bolt does not require. Um, I, I end up with just lots of material that I have to then continue to use in interestingly different ways rather than repeating the same thing. So I've sort of had the opposite problem that somebody that's using natural materials and it just takes so long to collect enough natural material to build a basket. And I, you know, I'm so respectful of people that take that time and that work in, in the using their natural materials. It's the- Lynn, you have your hand up. Um, I, I say that my work is all concept driven um, and, and that's true, but I've also switched from working with, you know, traditional fibers to paper. Um, and, and I did that, it was a conscious decision because I wanted to be able to control the color, the pattern, the texture of what I was working with. And I never thought that I would do that, but I did. And I've been doing that now for almost 10 years. And um, it, it's about being able to control my work. Fantastic. Does anyone else have anything to add to this question? Yes, uh, Lewis? Yeah, color. I start with color. Color motivates me. And then I start putting colors with that color and it grows. I've, I've tried to be a conceptual artist and it has not gone well. Um, so I, I just make things. I think um, I should call myself a decorative artist. Sometimes concepts um, adhere to the work as I'm working. I start thinking about something and it evolves into something that's more about an idea, but I always start with the color. Fantastic. Janet, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was, I was sort of referring back to the, the gathering of the material. And um, it's to me, it's so much part of the whole process and it, it doesn't actually feel like work because being out there is just wonderful. And um, I find it all pretty, meditative um the stitch just i don't know being about being around this being in nature and seeing this environment that has been around for so so long and then dealing with seaweed which as a species is like billions of years old among these huge rocks that have been there for millions of years and then you come home and you it's a slow process of the stitching. And um, so my baskets take a very, very, very long time. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change it, yeah. So our next question that we have here is, um, and I think we've uh, seen throughout the night that there's this wonderful lineage that runs through uh, many of the group here. Um, do you have a basket maker, teacher, coach you admire? And uh, if so, who and why? You know, that's such a dangerous question. Uh, <laughs> because I, I could probably rattle off 20 names of, of basket makers I am indebted to. Um, either through formal workshops or just informal conversations. It, it's a very generous uh, community. And, you know, there's a way in which we didn't invent this stuff. People have been twining and coiling and plating for thousands of years. So um, we just kind of show each other what we know. And... Um, it, it, but you're right, there is a lineage, I, you know, um, I taught Natalie, Natalie taught Lynn, and, you know, with, I, so I call Lynn my grandchild, you know, that's sort of, <laughs> but yeah, 
Uh, Jeanette, I see your hand up. Yeah, it was actually, it's, it's my question. <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> I've asked it because I'm new to this group and new to this craft, basically, and or relatively new. And um, yeah, I was just, I'm just hoping, I don't know, I would love to hear from everybody. So maybe we could do this informally. Um, maybe you can all sort of send me your your gurus or the people that you uh, that inspire you and um, yeah I'd love to see more work and of why you know wide variety of work of all kinds yeah yeah uh, Nat Natalie I see your hand up yeah um, I'm I totally second what um, Lois just said it's really it's we're part of a long long history of, of weavers and there is a lot of learning from each other but um, Jeanette, I think uh, one of the things that I'm really inspired by is designers, architects, engineers. There are so many people who are using these weaves in all sorts of ways um, from, you know, in incorporating technology to, to uh, smart technology to, to using drones. I mean, there's you know, and, and incorporating some of these weaves in aerodyne in, in, in aeroscience. I mean, it's, it's just, it's not just, the basket world is vast. It's mm -hmm. so vast. And so if you, I think one thing that really helped me um, and keeps me inspired is to see that these weaves live in so many different disciplines and they don't necessarily always look like a basket and they don't necessarily always use what we consider traditional basket weaving material but they are alive and that's why i think they may you know they they sometimes have this 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 reputation as being old and traditional and they are but they're also incredibly modern so i so i think the inspirations for for me at least for for these weaves go well beyond the what we consider sort of the traditional basket. Uh, Lisa, I see you and welcome back. You popped out <laughs> for a you. second. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but um, our um, Wi-Fi went out for a bit. So are you on, are you talking about what um, inspires us and how we work? Is that the question? If you have a teacher, a coach, or a mentor that inspired you and why? Oh, um, so many. I, I've heard enough of what everybody's been saying about it's being such a generous group and, and, and the idea that since one of the things I love about basketry, basketry is that when you look at it, you can see how it's made. It doesn't mean you could do it, but you can follow this and see it go over that and under that and you can figure it out. So that kind of information uh, seen with your hands is really a, a very potent part of what we do, I think. So when somebody comes along who's working in, um, Ellen Weiske, uh, who's on Deer Isle, works with wire and she taught a class in tinkering using, with, using wire. Well, you know, it's, it's a whole other thing and yet it is basketry as well. And so that sent me off into a whole other way of working uh, and then incorporating paper with that. So we're very lucky to not have to have kilns and and fires and you know all sorts of machinery to do what you do so we can all be teachers and we can all be students fantastic uh, arlene i see your hand up um the thing that i would like to say is um, i had to start somewhere so i started in the traditional making realm with teachers who were teaching traditional and and then it just developed from there uh it, it the the teachers were incredible um and and then they allowed they taught you some basics and then they allowed you and encouraged you to go out and experiment on your own and that's where i think i am most impressed with the contemporary makers today because they did lose they did learn the traditional methods and then went out on their own to experiment and that's why we have such a rich field of contemporary makers today um, as well as our traditional makers. Uh, it, it's just such a rich field that we have. And I think we're starting to be recognized as artists um, and, and not just craft people, even though we are both. And we are, we are both and we're both. 
Uh, Jeannie, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, I, you know, I think continuing with what Arlene's saying is, you know, I've had some great teachers and they do, they let you, they invite you to go off and explore and do other things. And so it becomes really circular because you start to work in one direction that, and there's so many directions to go in in basketry that what happens is you head off in a direction and your teachers haven't headed off in that direction. So you start teaching your teachers what you've learned and they're off in another direction. And so, you know, the, the give and take just keeps coming and it's like this spiral where if we all teach everybody what we're doing and everybody takes those in different directions. And, you know, I know Natalie was my first teacher. Lynn was in class with me. I met Lynn that way. And then Lois became a teacher and I helped Lois teach now. And I have taught other people and, you know, it's just, it becomes, it, it becomes this, this organic network that, that grows. And we love adding new people like Jeanette into, oh. into the, into the fold. And um, it's, it's amazing how many things suddenly become, oh, you know that part? Okay, well, then you have to teach that to me. And the, everybody's differing backgrounds matter um, when you're trying to, you know, I'm starting to paint paper and I don't work with paint. So I need to seek, seek assistance from other people. And how do I use paint? Um, I'm a fabric dyer. So paint is a whole different medium for me. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, I see your hand up. Yeah, I think for uh, a few of us who've been doing this for a long time, um, there were books, actual books. Donna Milex was a natural basketry or whatever it was. That's how I learned to coil. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you went out and got clothesline and I used some thrums from some weaving I'd been doing and I coiled a basket. Now with, with YouTube, <laughs> the truth is you can learn virtually any basketry technique online and, and get the technique. But that's the same as somebody saying to paint, here's how you stretch a canvas, here's a brush, here are the colors, paint a mm. picture. It's, you know, anybody can show you that, but it's what you do with it then that becomes what's important and uh, what stimulates and excites us. I think if we all did the same thing again and again and again, it wouldn't be exciting. So it's the art of it, not the craft of it, although the craft is incredibly important. But that investigation and the searching and the adding and um, that's what that's what's exciting, I think, for us. Fantastic. So before we move over to some audience questions, I, there's a lot of people excited to ask some things. I wanted to give everybody a refresher of the show. So I'm going to quickly play the uh, video of the show again so everybody can just get a sense of uh, who made what. Cool. So bear with me for just a moment. And then while we're watching this, if uh, the audience members have some questions, pop them in the chat and I'll be happy to answer them on your behalf.
thank you so much. So one of the first questions we have here is, do the designs ever come to you in your dreams? Does anyone ever have basketry dreams? I solve problems in dreams. I start weaving, particularly when I'm working with Mad Weave, I start weaving and it's like, how am I gonna get that to do this? And yeah, I mean, I absolutely dream. I saw someone else's hand up. Does anyone else? Uh, Lynn, I see your hand up. Um, I definitely have things come to me in dreams. And it last week I had to get up in the middle of the night and write things down because I was afraid I was going to forget the solution that I had come up with. And I think it just, it, it my brain sort of quiets down and I can actually think and, and so it, the solution came to me and I had to get up and write it down. Anybody else? So as we're waiting for some audience questions to come in, do any of you have any questions for any of your peers here tonight? Hmm. Lynn. I have a question for Lissa. You have an impressive, resume of uh, works in, in major museums in a wide array of, of, of materials. Um, can you tell us what you're working on now? Um, it's funny, you should ask. I, um, um, hmm. I'm curating two shows for next summer that are a multimedia show. They're not just baskets, although there are some basket makers involved. Mm -hmm. And so I'm doing a lot of curating and that kind of thing. And I'm working in the studio uh, on smaller things. My studio is very small now uh, and working out ideas. And the, the, one of the last things I did was the hundred spoons. The spoons that are in the show came from a group of a hundred spoons, wow. which was like last winter, you know, it was months and months of working. But what it did was make me look at these connections of putting things together in a different way and materials I would have thought, well, how could that be a spoon? And so having a very narrow uh, agenda really kind of brought up all sorts of ideas of possibilities. So that's what I'm kind of looking at uh, going forward now is this taking time to, to pay attention to that because I don't have anything um, that I have to have a deadline. I don't have a deadline coming up, which is good. Um, but also in curating shows, I'm I'm just loving, Lois, you've done this, loving this kind of thing, getting people together who wouldn't have otherwise gotten together, seeing what that work is like, uh, the friendships that come out of it, the, the excitement of the audience for seeing a show and a body of work um, is very exciting. Um, yeah, so basically I'm, um, I'm going to play for a while now. Yeah. I've been very lucky. I was one of the ones who started with the, you know, the great um, uh, basketry scare of the, you know, the seventies when everybody was, you know, everything was basketry, basketry, basket. It was, it, most of you weren't around then, but it was um, really extraordinary. So the field grew and I got to ride that. So the reason that some of my work is out there and in museums and things is because the basketry collections that came out of that, that sort of surge, I was a part of that. Uh, not to say, you know, I, I like my work, it's fine. But it, it, historically, um, it really uh, was a good time to be starting this. And I always say that if you do something adequately well, long enough, uh, someone's going to notice. And I think that's what, you know, so a lot of us who started out in basketry, that's kind of where we are, I think. Does that that's answer cool. your question? Yes, thank you. So from the audience, we have a question for Sui. Um, do you think you will be experimenting with other media having moved from monofilament to cable ties? Ah, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was a big step from like a monofilament to uh, cable ties. And uh, now, yeah, I'm just turning back to like the silk very organic, you know, uh, the, uh, cause like the, when I was in Korea, like, uh, and, and I studied uh, contemporary embroidery. So I made like the hand, uh, the silk papers and I just, uh, the stitch and embroidery like on the papers. 
Uh, so I still remember that, like the feelings and how I, uh, how much I enjoyed. So it's totally different, like the making some sculptural forms and like uh, with uh, the industrial materials and also at the same time working with a very organic form, uh, work or, organic like material, material like and very natural materials uh, with creating something. So I'm just doing experimenting like those uh, the two different ways. So uh, I will keep like experimenting, <laughs> yeah, myself. Yeah. So let's see how, how it works. Fantastic. Another question coming in from the audience is, would anyone recommend uh, a place you can take classes that focus on basketry, uh, such as Haystack or any others? Lois, I see your hand up. Yeah, this is something that that I experienced in, back in the when I started baking baskets. And I was fortunate in that there was an excellent teacher, Judy Olney, teaching near where I lived. But there is no basket school. I mean, there's no place you can go and get an MFA in basket making. And you you have to put out lots of um, feelers and just look all over the place because even the, the schools like Penland and Haystack and Snow Farm, um, John C. Campbell, John C. Campbell has a lot of basketry classes, but they'll do one class or two classes in a session or in a whole season. Um, the National Basketry Organization keeps a pretty good list of where things are available. Um, right here in New England, we we really have some good sources. Um, people don't know about North Country Studio Workshops, which is held at Bennington every other year. And a lot of these people have been there. There's always a basket class offered at that. So, um, but I found I, I desperately wanted to learn all kinds of basket making and I had to travel all over the country. And it was kind of like, I would find someplace somebody was teaching baskets and I would go. And it was good for me because I really got a, a, an exposure to a lot of different basket makers and a lot of different techniques. But, um, and the other thing is get hold of those of us you see on this screen and, and say, you know, what do you know about where there's gonna be basketry taught? And people will tell you. Lois, add Snow Farm to the list. I thought I said Snow Farm, but Snow Farm is is definitely um, uh, on the list. And, you know, there are guilds all over the country. And those guilds often are the best place to start. They That's welcome nice. beginners. Um, and you can find that you just have to go online. And we're getting some really helpful things in the chat here. Uh, Natalie, thank you for sharing a list of places and uh, even people in our audience are sharing uh, places you can look for basketry. Um, although I feel if everyone here started a school, I would attend, I feel very inspired. <laughs> hey, there's now there's an idea. <laughs> yeah, if we have any funders in the audience, let's, uh, let's get a basketry school going right here at the Cahoon. Um, we have a question coming in that says, I love the responsiveness of what you all seem to feel. Does anybody ever struggle with justifying doing what they do in terms of time or purpose? <laughs> I, I got to do it. I think that's the perfect response. Uh, Elizabeth, I see your hand up too. Well, of course. I mean, everybody who's an artist, you're you're always not struggling with time, but you're struggling with um, whether your work, even, you know, I've been doing it since, you know, the early eighties. And, um, you know, there's times when you wonder if basketry is gonna continue or people uh, are going to come to shows or purchase your work or be interested. Um, and you have to keep, and I think just this group of people here and, in all these organizations that you mentioned, there's so much support there. And so many people that are really dedicated and interested. Um, but of course, everybody has some times when they wonder all the time they put into it. <laughs> wonder if some days, you know, it's challenging. It is, but we're dedicated. Uh -huh. 
Arlene, I see your hand up. I, I think questioning, um, I'm going to speak for myself, questioning my work has been um, part of the journey, but the enjoyment and the need to continue doing it is also a top priority in life. So it it's, um, I think it's the maker in us. It's we have to, and and we we do struggle and we do question, but we also continue. And I think that's where we all are at. And oh, Lisa, I see your hand. I'm just now, as I said, I have a small studio and I have things unsold work from forty some years that is not fitting here anymore. So I uh, just. I just rented a storage unit and just today started taking things out to put them in the back room of our house to clean them up and wrap them up and take them to a storage unit. There are pieces that are that I did in college, in graduate school, and then everything since then. So since 1970 on. So that's a lot of, it's not a lot of, thank goodness, I don't have a lot of unsold work or I wouldn't still be doing this, but um, seeing that work again is so reassuring to me. Because when I did it, a lot of it, I thought, you know, why would anybody care about this? What is this about? I don't have a voice. It's not important. It's, you know, all of the things that you might think. But going back and looking at all of it now, I see there was always a voice in that work. There, it was always my work uh, in a way that I couldn't accept while I was beginning to do it. Um, I'm telling you this because it's so recent, because it was just today that this happened. Um, and there's something quite lovely. I don't have children. Um, I have a very good home life and love my husband and all of that. So I have a, you know, a good social life. But it's seeing that, that um, essence of my life as an artist in front of me was just a, a wonderful, profound kind of moment. So I would say to anyone who says, why am I doing this? Is it worth it? Do it for like 50 years and look back and you'll be amazed, I think. You know, if you do it well, you're going to be, you're going to be amazed. Thank you. That's a, a wonderful sentiment. And I can say my firsthand experience working here at the museum and seeing the amount of people who have gone through that exhibit, who have this amazing curiosity. I've seen this like, uh, uh, just like exuberant joy at seeing all of your work on so many faces and so many interesting questions, repeated viewings, and people spending an immense amount of time with all of your pieces. I mean, I think the I think that really talks to how important the work all of you have done. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Sue. Yeah, I see your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, just one last comment. Like so, uh, I. Uh, yes, I um just it, now like the what I explain about my situation is I have two kids and six year old girl and two year old girl. So now like I'm struggling with those two kids and like the and it's really difficult to make time to just time like just working, <laughs> just yeah, focusing on my own. Yes, yeah, so I always like always struggle with those kind of situation, and also like the my work is pretty big. So after the finishing the installation or you know the exhibition, I always have to deinstall and store like my work in a storage <laughs> and lots of labor <laughs> required. So I and also like a lot of like email work. So <laughs> stressful. So somehow, like the making and creating my uh, the, my work is kind of like a meditation. Yeah. So <laughs> very mm -hmm. irony. Like a, it's really intense and have to focusing on my work. And but um at, yeah, at the same time, it's kind of like a meditation. And then uh, slowly focus on like my myself. That's really irony. And yeah, that's why I'm doing my work. Keep doing Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Um, does anyone else have any questions they would like to ask our group? And if not, uh, I think this is a good place for all of us to end tonight. And uh, I want to first thank, first and foremost, thank all of our panelists who attended tonight. We really appreciate you and your support. I think we can all agree that uh, we owe a huge debt of thanks to Annie Dean, the curator of the show, for bringing everyone together. 
Um, yes. Thank you, Annie. Yeah, a round of applause. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, so if you'd like to know more about the artists tonight or uh, see their information, I have placed all of their websites in the chat. Uh, Interwoven is ongoing until December 19th, and it should not be missed. If you enjoyed this panel, please check out our other panels, interviews, studio visits, and more on our new YouTube channel. It will be a great help to us if you hit the subscribe button. This will help us continue to bring you more exciting virtual programming to enjoy. Mm -hmm. You can also stay connected with what we're doing at the Cahoon Museum by signing up on our website to receive emails that will let you know of future events, including our Sunday series. And this week, we are hosting the amazing Jeanette Lindertsen at 2 p.m. on this Sunday, where she will talk about her amazing work. Also, look out for Elizabeth White Schultz on November 14th and Arlene McGonigal on November 21st. If you would like to support our work here at the museum, please consider making a donation or joining us as a member as we continue to bring you new exhibitions and programming. And don't forget to connect with us on social media to stay up to date with the day-to-day -day activities here at the Cahoon Museum. Thank you to our panelists tonight. I think this has been incredibly wonderful and incredibly enriching to the audience uh, who uh, got to hear everything everyone had to say. And uh, I'm looking forward personally to you all starting the uh, the basketry school. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Basketry school? Is that the... <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for running the... the one for, you're uh, all yeah. going to start together. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It was a joy. Thank you, Michael. Yes, thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.